Stephen and Frankie have been married for 40 years. But <laughs> their 40th anniversary, they were going to renew their vows. So Frankie describes her to her friend the dress that she was wearing. So her friend said, well, Frankie, what color are your shoes? She said, silver. Of course, you know, you know Stephen. Stephen said, yep, silver to match your hair. <laughs> so Frankie pointed his head and said, I guess you'll go barefoot. <laughs>
when you hear somebody out of the clear blue start, especially when they're under attack or when they're hitting something that's really, really touching a nerve in them and they start saying, oh my God, or they start speaking about God, whether they go to church or not, even if they claim to be an atheist, when you hear that, what you are hearing is that measure of faith seeping out. So now, now, now every man has been given a measure of faith. And listen to this now. Y'all say Lord the plow, Pastor. Lord the plow. Alright, ready to get ready to crank her up. Every man, every woman in this place has been given a chore. They've been given I'm sure right then was to find the buzz. Every man, every woman in this place, y'all say he's talking about you, has been given a mission. Matter of fact, I want y'all to say, he didn't forget me. Say it, he didn't forget me. Now, does he give you a mission? He's given you an opportunity. How many read the uh, Mighty Army this morning? Somebody read the Mighty Army out loud for me. If you can find it. I don't know where my phone's at. Wow. Wow. So I see this. Everybody has a mission. But unless everybody got a mission, you say, well, if I got a mission, God, then why am I not using it? God's given, or see this. If he gives you a talent, he gives you a mission, then he's going to also, with that mission, when you're ready, he's going to give you, remember, you've got to be ready. He's going to give you that opportunity. I'll get somebody to say, now open your eyes. Say, open your eyes. Look around you. Open your eyes, look around you. There is a, cho a chance. There is an opportunity. Not as an opportunity, but when you get this opportunity, then there's going to be challenges. Challenges come in the form of problems. Somebody say, what? Say that, what? Problems? What? Satan's not taking it lightly because when you realize that you have a chore, a mission, when you realize God didn't forget you, when you realize you've got a chance, opportunity to use what God has given you, then he brings the challenges or the problems because Satan's not taking it lightly. But we have to have confidence that he gives us enabling Faith. Amen? He gives us faith and enables us to stand up to the challenge, to stand up to the tough winds, to stand up to the heavy rain, to stand up to the problems and carry out our missions. Romans 12 and 3 says, God has given every man a measure of faith. Matthew 17 and 20 says, if we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, we can say to this mountain, take your smallest finger right now. Find your the one with the smallest fingernail. If you got fake fingernails, just trust me. <laughs> Find the smallest fingernail. If you got long nails, this may not you and I multiply it by ten. On the surface of your smallest fingernail, you can place. 100 mustard seeds flat. Whoa. One hundred mustard seeds. If you've got longer fingernails multiplied by two, three, four times, one hundred mustard seeds on that fingernail and lay it flat. You see, God says if you have that kind of faith, which means, God, I don't know if I can make it. I'm really having a hard time. I'm not sure if I even want to try anymore. Guess what? You're, when you even say, God, I'm not sure if I want to try anymore. God, I don't know if I can take it anymore. God, I don't know if I can do this. What you're actually doing is, without you even realizing it, is that mustard seed faith is activating in you, that measure of faith is acting in you and Satan is using the negative to cancel out the power 
of that little bitty seed that a hundred can fit on your finger. Now, wow. So, so everybody's been given a measure of faith. Faith is a grain of mustard seed. You can say this mountain. How many have ever seen any mountains? Of course, we live in flatlands. I went to Tennessee a little while ago, a little while back, and I'm going to tell you, some of the mountains I saw were absolutely phenomenal. They would take your breath. The mountains of North Carolina, they will take your breath when you come upon and start seeing these humongous things before you. And Jesus always gave, gave uh, uh, verbal and, 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 and using uh, uh, people's sight to give his lesson. So he was probably holding that mustard seed. And he was looking over at a mountain and said, you can look at, have you had this much faith? You can look at that mountain and say, be there removed to be cast in the sea and it shall be done for you. So now, so now, if that's so, somebody said that sounds good in theory, Pastor. Somebody say that. But you don't know what I'm going through. Say that. No, I don't. You don't know what I'm going through. Amen. We have no idea what any person is going through in here. Even when, even, even to be honest with you, even though I know what I might be going through, there's other things I don't know what I'm going through. There's some things I have no idea that I'm going through until it's already over. It's everybody's like that. Okay? So now watch this. We must realize that we all have a chore. We must realize that Satan realizes that too. And so what he does is his plan is to throw up stumbling blocks and throw up walls. What's the difference between a stumbling block and a wall? A stumbling block is something that trips you up, that impedes your progress. It is something that, that you get up and fall down, get up and fall down. You get going a little bit, you get up and fall down. And eventually, because you keep getting up and falling down, and getting up and falling down, you give it a shot, you get knocked back down. You take two steps forward, you take four steps back. You get up and say, today I'm going to do it, today I put my mind up, today is the day. And you get in there and get knocked down again. Again, Satan is trying to negate that mustard seed faith, that measure of faith that God has placed in you. So that's a stumbling block. No, there's stumbling blocks. There's walls. There's a difference between a stumbling block and a wall. With a stumbling block, the progress is being impeded. You're still moving, but you just keep getting knocked down. You keep tripping up. You keep thinking you're going somewhere and you don't. Thinking you're getting somewhere and you don't. If I can tell you how many guys at petitioners said, I'm not coming back, and I'll see them months later. I'm not coming back this time, and I'll see them again. I promise you, you'll never see me again, and I'll see them again. This is a stumbling block. But then there's the walls. The walls don't impede your progress. The walls stop your progress. Some of y'all are you thinking right now when I thought about the stumbling blocks. You think about the times that you told God, I'm not going to do it again. Or God, with your help, I'll make it. Or God, show me what to do, and I'll do it. And you just kept falling and falling and falling. Then when I say, wow, some of you are going, the fourth said, well, I just said, well, something, hey, this isn't a stumbling block. I can't even move. That's the walls. I try to move forward, but I keep getting stopped. I'm trying to move, but I can't find the door. The wall's before me, and I can't find the door. Honestly, in some of y'all right now, I can see it. You're doing this. If I could just find the door, I could get out of this mess. If I could just find this door, I could get out of this. I could move forward, but I can't find the door. I remember one of our fire training. Of course, ours is different than guys now. Guys nowadays, it's amazing some of the fire training. When I hear Doug talking in D.C., all the fire training they had, back in my day, we had a, a, a SCBA pack home, and we went in a room, and it was flooded with smoke, and we went in a room, and they shut the door, and it was totally black in there and smoke everywhere. And we got crawling on our hands and knees and we had to keep up with our buddy as we're going around and maneuvering through this path that they had passed plate made for us uh, in this room as we're going through. They said, okay, now cut your air pack off. So we cut our air pack off. And they said, now stick it under your arm and breathe. I breathe a whole lot better until I stuck it under my arm. <laughs> I said, mm, I need to change any first, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember they said, find your way 
out. So with the air pack on, it turned off. There is no air. The hose under my arm, and I'm holding it tight so I can breathe. And I'm trying to crawl and trying to keep up with my buddy in front of me while somebody's holding my leg behind me. Or trying to crawl out of the dark room, trying to find the door. And I thought to myself, I said, wow, if this was the real thing, how many people will never make it out? Some of y'all today, you feel the same way. You've got the Bible, that's your air pipe. You've got the Holy Spirit. He's, he's breathing. You got God just, just breathing his way towards you. You got the air pipe, but something's happening, the air pipe's turned off. You're trying to breathe, you, you, you're trying to maneuver, trying to get some air going. It's dark, you can't see anything. You, you're moving, you're filling the wall. The smoke is, 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 is making you get sick at your stomach. That's Satan doing his best to negate that measure of faith that God has put. In every person. Y'all say every person. Every person. And how does he do it? Number one, here's his weapons. Number one, it's just pure distractions. Oh yeah. A distra What's a distraction? Something that causes you to look in the wrong direction. You know, if you got ADHD like some of us in here do, and I won't mention anybody's name. When you holler squirrel, that means you're going along and everything's going to find all sitting good. You know, uh, just this morning, I heard somebody holler squirrel on the hood. They were hollering to him, praising worship practice, but they were hollering, watch out for the squirrel, Paul. Paul. Who are they talking about? <laughs> Distractions. Looking in the wrong direction. Man, it's amazing. If Satan can get our mind off our mission and distract us, to keep us looking in the wrong way, to keep us looking in the wrong direction. Again, the Bible says, you man put his hand in the plow, looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God, does not mean you're not going to heaven. It means that you're going to have problems here on earth. You're going to have problems with your mission because your mission is to plow and plow a straight line to, to, to plant good seed. But if you're looking this way, you can't plow a straight line because the plow's going all over the place while you're looking behind you. Distractions. And of course, then there's distortions. How many of you ever heard this? You're going through problems and a well-meaning Christian comes up to you while you're having your problems. He might not even know you're having a problem. You might be saying, pray for me, brother, because such and such. And they go, well, you know, if you were a good Christian, you wouldn't be having these problems. Really? If you were a good Christian, if you really were sanctified, then Satan will begin to best you with this because once you're sanctified, the Bible says that you, you're you a different person. Not only are you taken out of the world, but now the world's taken out of you and look at what you're going to do. The old man is dead. I heard one guy say that, that they asked me who was the people on the cross. I said there were two thieves. He said one of them was Paul's dad. I said, Paul's father was on the cross. He said, yeah, Paul said, my old man died for Christ. <laughs> Burn the book. But the problem is, when it says the old man is dead, it doesn't mean graveyard dead. That word dead means rendered inactive. That's all it means. Rendered inactive. And there's been a many a time while I'm in service, the old man is dead, but now I get in Greenville traffic and the old man wants to get behind the steering wheel. Hawk the horn. That was really funny. I remember hearing John Hagee said one day he got behind this old lady at the traffic light. He said the traffic light was red and said it turned green and as it was turning green, the old lady finally looked up. By the time she looked up, it turned yellow again, so she looked back down. Went through the light again, and it turned gray. He, he said, she'll get this next time. She looks up. Light changed. She looked back down. The third time, he tooted his horn just gently. 
by the fourth or fifth time, he's talking his horn. And finally he says, Move it, sister! Or I'll come up and move it for you! And he turned around beside him, and there was one of his church members waving at him. <laughs> the car beside him. <laughs> that distortion. If you serve God, everything's going to be all right. If you're doing everything right, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, there is no problem. If the old man is dead, you're not going to have a problem doing your chore. And then, of course, there, of course, there is the divisions. Let me go about there. There is the divisions. Because once you start stumbling, once you start hitting that wall, once you start with the distractions and the distortions, pretty soon... You and the people next to you who are also having distortions and distractions, now all of a sudden, it starts dividing you. It can be you and your wife. It can be you and your boss man. It can be you and your children. It can be children in the playground. It can be, be teachers at work. Whatever. Co-workers. It's because everybody's fighting these battles and nobody wants to tell that I'm fighting a battle. Or if they try not to say they're fighting a battle, they're still having that inner turmoil and then somebody beside them starts up with theirs, and here it goes again. So now, watch this. Warning. Challenges ahead. Let's look at this. What are challenges? Problems. 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 The first challenge, the first problem. It was an uneasy task. It had been an exhausting day. They had been ministering. They had been fighting demons. They had been doing all kinds of stuff. They were tired. They just wanted to go sit down and rest. You know, I thought about yesterday. Yesterday was really a pretty easy day, but, but I was in Newbern at, at 8 o'clock. I was in Farmville at, at uh, I don't know, I left at 2 o'clock to go to Farmville. And I got back from, I went to a, a, a meeting in Farmville at the Mayor's board meeting, and then I was there as a spiritual director for last night's service. So it was like 9, 10 o'clock before I got home last night. And that's where I did some more work on my message. And I was doing more work on my message. I was also writing letters for guys in B5 that carried a court with them. And so I'm doing all this stuff. I got everything going on. And then Duke had the nerve to play last night. <laughs> and so I'm doing all this and I'm watching the game and I'm getting everything going and finally by the time 10 o'clock came, I was totally exhausted. Some of y'all had some challenges yesterday too, this week. Just exhausting days. So now, not only is it an exhausting day, but now Jesus puts some on a ship and look at it, it's, 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 it's uneasy timing because now there's a severe storm. Wait a minute. Jesus put us on the ship. And now we got a storm. Jesus got me this job. I remember I was working at Fountain. DC and Daniel's friends would come with me and other people come to me and say, can you please get me a job at Fountain? I said, well, it's not like what you think it is. It's always a piece of cake. DC and Daniel riding around in a good old truck and a good car and they're doing great and they're making money. And blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, but you don't know what they put up with. They say everything's awesome. I said, they'll tell you one too. <laughs> and I remember getting somebody a job one day and he said, man, please, 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 one of these friends, please, 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 get me a job. I said, okay. He said, where am I going to work with you? I said, no, you're not going to work with me. I said, I'm an engineer. Dude, you don't have any skills at all. You're going to be put on the assembly line. They're going to teach you skills. And he goes, well, that's good, that's good, that's good. I can do that. I can do that. I said, okay. I got him the job. One week after he got hired, he came to me and said, what'd you do to me? I said, what did I do to you? I've done nothing. I said, I don't even see you. I'm doing my job. You're doing yours. He said, what in the world did you do to me? I said, I didn't do anything. He said, you put me in hell. What happened to the last cushy job D.C. had? The last cushy job Daniel had? I said, you're working with D.C. <laughs> D. 
He's sitting there just smiling and laughing and building the boats. He's having a good time. His friends over there going, <laughs> A week later, he goes to me and says, Dude, I can't pick it anymore. I'm about to go crazy. And I said, Didn't you say God gave you that job? He said, Well, I thought God gave me that job. He said, But now I begin to think Satan did. <laughs> The third week he was gone. <laughs> don't raise your hands. Please don't raise your hands. And please don't point any fingers. How many know that God gave you your job? How many know that God placed you here today? How many know that God put you in your marriage? How many believe that God gave you your children? I just tell Beth, I said, you're a special one. I said, I couldn't pick with D.C. and Daniel. I got pop luck with them. <laughs> I said, but you, I got a good chance to go pick you out, try you out in a little while. Ride you around the block, kick the tires. You decide you like us, we decide we like you. Done deal. This is Daniel. It's what you get is what you get. How many believe, don't raise your hands, God gave you those children. You can't give them back either. <laughs> How many believe God gave you your spouse? How many believe God gave you you? Somebody saw my brothers last week and said, how come they ain't got any hair and you do? I said, it's very simple. Hair don't grow on metal. <laughs> I said, they used to be called hard heads all the time. I said, I was the shiny child. <laughs> So watch this. You believe, they believe, they saw Jesus. He told them to get in the ship. He's in there with them. They expect a smooth sailing because they got Jesus with them. They didn't get smooth sailing. It was hard. It was rough. For experienced fishermen not to be able to handle it. Wow. It was some tough stuff. Some of y'all right now are going to... God, did you really do this? Did you really give these children to me? Yes, he did. Did you really give me my hard-headed husband? Yes, he did. Did you really give me that beautiful wife? Yes, he did. I looked out for y'all ladies this time. I looked out for you. Did he give me that job? Were you praying for it? Has it supplied your needs? Has it caused you to grow? Yes. Then why? Is it so hard? See, there's an unending, an unending temptation. The ship was sinking. And the Savior was sleeping. Oh, God. The ship is sinking. And the Savior is sleeping. You have things in your life, you know, God put you in, God gave you, and now you're trying your best to make it through this. And you knew God was with you when they put you in there, but just like that guy found him, all of a sudden Jesus is asleep. The same God that gave him the job must have backed out because now he thinks Satan's gave him the job. But that shows us. That Jesus is at perfect peace no matter how bad the storms are. See, Jesus led them in the storm. They followed him into a crisis. But always, God's will is not always smooth sailing. Matter of fact, smooth sailing makes, never makes a skilled sailor. I 
watch people many times. They talked a good game. Oh, they threw out some good stuff. And when they started going through problems, things changed. The guys that I listen to the most, the women that I listen to the most, the ones that seem to have the most to say to me and speaks to my heart are those that have been through hell and back. Because they're not just reading it out of a book. They've been there. It's not always smooth sailing. So there's the challenge. Problems, problems, problems. So I read that eye chart. We walk by faith, not by sight. Wow. 2020. Let me tell you something about the chance or the opportunity of faith. Faith is not a heavenly credit card. It's not a get out of the jail free card. Faith is the heartbeat, the driving force in us that invites God and His power into any situation. The scripture says, Romans 1 and 17, the just shall live by faith or by faithfulness. That word live means to live the real life. To live in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Clint Eastwood wasn't the one that started that. Because I have faith in Jesus Christ, I believe and trust in his promises. Then I have real life in the middle of when things are going good, when things are going bad, when things are being awesome, when things are not being awesome. Real faith. Weekend before last when I preached that funeral for that young lady that got killed down here at Campbell's Creek. I was with the other pastor. The other pastor, he's a young man, a very young man. He had two young children. <laughs> and he said, come back and walk with me. So I come back and talk with him. He said, now you're going to start this out. I'm going to finish. I said, that's fine. However you want to do it, we'll make, we'll make it happen. And then he looked at me. And he apologized for me doing a funeral. And I said, I'm sorry, what? He said, I'm sorry that you're having to go through preaching this funeral after all the things you have been with because somebody had told him about Bethany. I hadn't told him, somebody else told him. He said, after all you went through with Bethany and now you're having to preach this funeral, I'm sorry. And I said, bro, since just before Bethany died, I've done 25 funerals. I said, this is not breaking my nerves. He said, but how long can you do this? He said, I couldn't handle it. When my kids, if something happened one of them, I said, well, when it first happened, I couldn't handle it. I said, I just had to hold on to God and trust Him. I said, but I was doing funerals the day before Bethany's funeral, literally the day before Bethany's funeral, the week before Bethany's funeral, did Bethany's funeral, did a funeral the week after Bethany's funeral. And again, he said, I'm so sorry. I said, don't be sorry. I said, this has not destroyed my faith. This has increased my faith. Because I watched God step in in a greater, greater way than I ever could have seen Him before. Because when your need is so great, His grace is always greater. And so no matter how bad your need is, though, you know, it's like the Super Bowls. We don't even have Super Bowls anymore. We got computers and we got everybody walking around doing this. Like I told you all the other day, I was in Walmart and this person walking past me and they're doing this. They would have hit me. They would have ran right into me as they're doing this. It was almost, I mean, it was within an inch of hitting me. If I hadn't looked up for my cell phone at the time. <laughs> I told that young man, I said, don't apologize. I said, what I found is, like the Super Bowl, remember, y'all, some of y'all ain't on Super Bowl, age. Y'all, some of y'all remember the Super Bowl, it was hard as a rock, felt like, hard rubber, and you threw it down, and the harder you threw it, the higher it bounced. 
the worst whooping I ever got was we had Super Bowls. We were trying to see who could make it bounce the hardest. Me and my two brothers, those two angels. And I hit it, and I hit it so hard that it went up in the ceiling, back down, hit the ceiling again, back down, and on the third time it got stuck in the ceiling. <laughs> two things happened. I won't mention either one of them. <laughs> <laughs> But faith is like that. The harder you get thrown down, the harder the situation is, the darker the night, the heavier the burden, the, the tighter the squeeze, the harder you get thrown down, the higher you bounce back up. God didn't say that it wouldn't happen to you. He just said that I'm going to be there. The just shall live. They shall breathe. They shall exist. Because of my faithful promises. Amen? Amen. amen. Y'all say amen. amen. We're, we're almost, we're almost, well, we, well, no, we're not. <laughs> Faith takes Satan's stumbling blocks and walls and accepts them as a challenge. It was so awesome. Yesterday we were at, and, and I will, I'll just stop it right here, because right? I don't want to get too far into this, because it's getting, DC, get ready to come play something. Yesterday we went to a thing called Stephen Ministries in Newburn about grieving. And it was me, and it was Don, and it was Gene, and it was Kay. And they asked, they asked, it had a whole list of things that you shouldn't say, but get said when somebody dies. And they asked, does anybody have any more? Of course, I raised my hand, and I said, yes. You shouldn't say God needed another angel. Beth is not an angel. Beth is in heaven being ministered to by angels. That's not going to give me any comfort Tell me Beth needs God needs another angel. And so Kay and I were talking and, and I told Cassie, Kay, I remember when Bethany was dying. And y'all have heard this a hundred times but I still just need to say it again. When Bethany was dying, Bethany said, I said, Bethany, if I could climb up in this bed, take your cancer, and die in your place, I would right now. And she said, no, Dad, you can't do that. She said, Dad, this is my challenge. This is my road. This is what I, this is my journey. She said, my journey's ending. I'm going to the next stage. And it was amazing for her to be talking like this. So I know it was God. And she said, but your journey is just beginning. She said, take all the stuff you've learned in the last four years and you use the healthy. And she said, remember this, Daddy, don't you let me down. And I told that to Kay yesterday. And Kay is just awesome. Kay said, challenge accepted. Yes. Challenge accepted. Faith takes your stumbling blocks, your walls, and it accepts as a challenge. Three places. First, your heart. There's stumbling blocks in your heart. When you say your heart, it's not just a physical boom, boom, boom heart. It's your mind, your emotion, your will. There's the challenge in your heart. There's also challenges in your home. Every last one of us. 
I've yet to see a perfect home. But I've yet to see a perfect heart. And then finally, challenging the happenstances. Happenstances is your work, the people that you come across, the people that you're helping, the people that God, whether you know it or not, has assigned you to, to learn from and to teach one or both. Faith in God doesn't make things easy. Faith in God makes things possible. There's a big change. There's something big in that. Will everybody stand? There's a lot more, but I just feel the need to stop it right now. I believe somebody right now, their, their faith has reached a different level this morning, a different plateau. They're seeing their challenges different this morning. They're seeing things in a different way. They're beginning to let their faith be cultivated like never before.
it was going to be promised. God said that he said, anybody out here that you've given away things, you're going to get it back on this earth a hundredfold. He said, but not without problems. There's going to be problems. Adversity. Or maybe there's just divisions. Because everybody's going through their own thing and everybody's trying to survive. So there you are. Stumbling blocks, walls. You're distracted. It's distorted. There's divisions. The you know God called you. But you weren't expecting all this. When God called you, you were expecting a nice launch out into the water, a nice little ride across the river, a ride across the lake. So you got the other side, it's going to be nice and pretty and clear and clean. And you get in there and all of a sudden, you're not seeing nice and pretty and clean. You're seeing dirty and hateful. You've had things happen to you that has actually ripped your heart apart, ripped at your soul has torn you limb from limb. But you're still in that boat. You're just waiting for Jesus to wake up before you sink. Nobody looking around every eye closed. If this is describing you, nobody looking around, this is just so you can get, jump start that faith, reverse that negative into a positive. All this is, you're reversing the negative, you're hitting it with a positive. If this is describing you this morning, with nobody looking around, would you slip that hand? Bless the Lord, bless him, bless him, bless him. I want y'all to repeat after me. Well, let me just, before y'all repeat, let me just say this. I was minister to that family and a well-meaning faithful Christian when they were asking why did this happen, why, why, why and a well-meaning faithful Christian said well you know the Bible says God will not war on your put one you take it I looked over at him and I said can I please address what you just said. He said, sure. And I said, don't take it offensive. I said, you're taking that out of context. God allows a lot of things coming our way that we can't handle on our own. But when He allows something to handle come our way that we can't handle our own, it should draw us closer to Him and to hold on tighter to His hand and He will guide us through it. So I want you to repeat after me. Lord, sometimes the circumstances seem overwhelming. Sometimes they seem more than I can handle. But I know that I have a promise that you will never leave me or forsake me. You will never leave me physically. You will never abandon me emotionally. You are there. Even when I feel like you're sleeping, you're still there. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch me, to help me realize that I'm not alone. That you're there. You're taking care of me. You're so settled in your care for me that it even seems like I'm sleeping. But I'm still watching. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you're watching. I give this day to you. I give my every problem, my every care, my every circumstance is in your hands. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise.
the whole time, and I know I haven't talked about it lately, but this just fits perfect right here. The whole time Bethany was sick, she said, Daddy, whatever you do, don't stop fighting. I said, well, Bethany, the same goes for you. Don't stop fighting. One day she told me, she said, Daddy, I don't know if I'll stop fighting or not, as she said, but I really need you to fight for me right now. And I said, I'm here. I'm not going to stop fighting. And I remember that day, hours later, she said, don't stop fighting, Dad. I said, I'm not. I remember that day when the doctor came and sat down beside me and said, Mr. Landon, it's in her brain. It's overwhelmed her. It's in her back bone. It's in her spinal cord. The cancer's everywhere. She says, whatever we do now, anything we do to her now would actually would just kill her. And I looked at that doctor and I said, she made me promise that I wouldn't stop fighting. And I'm not. And the doctor looked at me and told me something so profound. He said, you're not stopping the fight. You're just going to change the way that you fight. You're going to change the way that you handle this. And I said, I don't understand. And she said, you're a man of great faith. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, here's how we're going to fight it. We're going to take care of the pain. We're still going to do radiation on her back. But we're going to stop fighting the cancer because anything we do will kill her. She said, so now, you haven't stopped fighting. You're still fighting. She said, we just changed the mode. And we're giving it to God. And it took me quite some time for that to register in my head and in my heart. All I could hear was Bethany saying, don't stop fighting, man. Don't stop the fight. Finally, God got me this thick skull and let me know that I hadn't stopped the fight. I just changed the way I fought. Some of y'all in here right now, you're frustrated because it's not working. You're frustrated because you're giving all you got. But it doesn't seem to be working. And I'm here to tell you, don't stop fighting. Change the way you fight. Keep attacking sin. Keep attacking Satan. Keep drawing close together. But change the way you fight. And watch what God will do. Now, before we close, does anybody have need to come here for prayer? Everybody needs to come here for prayer. The altars are open. If you don't, we're going to close down. Don't forget Tuesday night we're talking about caregivers. And just so I can show the people what caregiver was, I ask people what they consider a caregiver because a lot of times we think it's just taking care of. It's just taking care of terminally ill people. It's not. We come up with about 12 categories of caregivers Tuesday night. 12. And we're going to go back this week and see if we want to come up with some more categories of caregiving. But I promise you, it's more like a support group and learning. And we're going to, God's going to do something special. Amen.
got this. Y'all met. Somebody say, God's got this. God's got this. Remember, don't stop the fight. Because sometimes if while you're, while you're fighting is not working, if all you got in your toolbox is a hammer, every problem becomes a nail. You need to expand your toolbox. Amen? Expand your toolbox. Come to tonight expecting something great. Because God is doing something great. Amen? Amen. Y'all are looking good today. Anybody tell you that? Of course, there is a couple of you could use some work, but that's all right. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this message. We hope that we can take it and use it for our advantage. And we ask that you bless everyone here and everyone that's not able to be here. We say our prayers to you for your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.